whole lot of people out here. Today. That's a good thing. We got. Sorry, I lost track of count. <laughs> but what I was looking for was a, a threshold number. I'll explain that in a moment. Before I get started, I don't have the skill sets of Logan, and Gist, and Charlie, and the amount of time that I think this is going to take is either going to be way too long and lose your attention or way too short which is a good thing because I'll give Charlie more time and we'll learn more from him than we will from me. So I should have done a dry run on this, but I didn't, and I'm sorry in advance. Let's open the Bible to Matthew chapter 26. Well, a smart kid would have written this down on paper as opposed to on the phone, but my writing is so bad that even I can't read it. Life ain't fair. Is that a true statement or is it a false statement? I'm seeing a little bit of it. It's not. It's not. Everybody has their own challenges. Everybody either overcomes them or doesn't. But it's not fair. In Elliott County, on top of a hill, there's a little family cemetery that I'm way behind on cleaning and it's going to be unreal hard to get done this year but among my ancestors up there is a great grandfather and bear in mind my papa was 62 when mom was born and mama was 41 so generationally where other people would have a great great grandfather those of my age well I, he, he's my great grandfather so he was born on February 12th that's right. No, he was born on December the 12th, 1858, and he died on December the 12th, 1939, no, 37. Who wants to die on their birthday? Is that fair? I don't think so. Now, he lived to, to be a ripe old age. I doubt that I'll get there. But nobody wants to die on their birthday. And I don't think anybody's going to say, well, that's fair. Nah, personally, I don't. I saw something in the news earlier this week. Let's see if I can pull this up here. Because if I can't, it wrecks me. All right, here we go. Man, it ain't loading. Oh, here we go. Woman announces her own death in social media posts gone viral. Cherish every moment. Let me get to the actual thing that was said. Her name was Daniela T. and I are in factory. If you're reading this, then it means I have died from my battle with cancer and my family are posting my final message on my behalf. Firstly, I just want to say that not all cancers are caused by lifestyle choices. In some cases, it's genetics, or unfortunately, it just happens. In my case, despite me being very healthy and active, a cancer started in my bile ducts, which was not caused by anything in my control, and my life was never the same again. I can't even pronounce the name of it, it's so long. It's a rare, aggressive cancer with, ob with often no obvious causes and no cure. I really do hope that in the years to come, more research is done about this horrid, cruel disease so that more lives can be saved. And she goes on, but when I read that, that just kind of reminded me of the things that you hear. Is that fair? She didn't smoke, she didn't drink. She got something that was so, so rare that there's, there's, there's no treatment for it really, there's no cure for it. And she was only in her 20s. She had a fiance, she had a family, obviously, that loved her. Loved her. And people will often say, and, and, and I know that, that everybody in this room has heard it at least once, why did God take that person at such a young age? And they present that argument of, well, you know, that ain't fair. 
and they try to present it as if it's God's fault, but it isn't. It isn't. I don't know if anybody knows Ron Halbor. He's, he's been a gospel preacher for a mighty long time. I knew him in, in the late 70s and early 80s. And he's got an email that uh, he sends out and plenty of good study material in it. But one thing that he was talking about was his, his wife uh, had to have a knee replacement. And in that, he included this, this quote, we can all thank Satan for introducing sin into the world against God's warning which resulted in the aging process, sickness, disease, injuries, and death, Genesis chapter 3. We must thank God for the gift of his son, who died as the perfect sacrifice to forgive our sins, if we will submit to him, Mark 16, 15, and 16, so that we can spend eternity in heaven where Satan, sin, the aging process, sickness, disease, injuries, and death can never enter and he's got an exclamation mark there. Revelations 21, verses 1 through 4. Now, life ain't fair, but it's not God's fault. It's the fault of Satan and sin. It's the fault of being deceived and tempted and falling to sin. For just a moment, I want to pivot to something else. Who knows what the Sanhedrin was in, in Jesus' day. It was the Supreme Court of the land for the Jews. I started doing some homework on that, and I remembered something Logan said. He's like, the number will be off. He said something to the effect of when you start doing research to have something to say, two-thirds of it, maybe more, are things you're not going to use, but you need to do the dive on it anyways to get something out of it, but you end up not using a lot. So, I did a whole lot of homework on the Sanhedrin, and, and we'll condense this a little bit. This was the Supreme Court of the Jewish nation. It heard appeals from inferior courts and tried cases of greater gravity than those which came before them. The members of the Sanhedrin were chosen from the chief priests, elders, and scribes. It was necessary to have priests and scribes in the body, and they were usually quite numerous, though the majority of the members are thought to have been laymen. The relative numbers of the three classes are not definitely known. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were both represented, sometimes uh, the one and sometimes the other being in the majority. Most of the scribes probably belonged to the Pharisees. Great care was taken in the selection of members who were required to be morally and curiously physically blameless. They were also expected to be learned in law, in sciences, in languages. It was necessary for them to have been judges in their native towns. So they started off kind of a lengthy career in doing this. It wasn't like they just got put into the Supreme Court. They, they, they have experience, and experience matters. There is no substitute for experience. The older I get, the more I recognize the truth of that that I didn't see 30 years ago. Uh, not that I'm old enough to be old yet. But they went they were transferred from the smaller Sanhedrin, which was the local towns, and then they met at the Temple Mount, and then the second small Sanhedrin, which the more condensed of them, uh, was at the, at the entrance of the Temple Hall. They were not eligible unless they were the fathers of families in order that they might be able to sympathize with cases uh, involving domestic affairs uh, brought before them. And this is from a website called BibleTruthPublishers.com. From other sources, they had power and jurisdictions over not just communities in, in what we refer to as Bible lands, but anywhere in the world that there were a, a group of Jews. They were subject to the laws and the jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin. While it may not have encompassed all of the, the uh, legalities of the Roman system, the religious side of it, the Jews were subject to that no matter where they were. So from this, you can get the Sanhedrin is supposed to be the best, the brightest, the smartest, with the elders, the most experienced, the most morally pure in all of the land. That being said, Matthew chapter 26, let's look at verses 1 through 5. And it came about when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, 
you know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be delivered up for crucifixion. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas. This is the Sanhedrin. And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, lest a riot occur among the people. Let's flip over to John chapter 11, in verses 47 through 53. This is right after the death and the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Boatloads of witnesses. An undeniable miracle. The Sanhedrin are incapable of this. Jesus is not. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees, again, this is the Sanhedrin, convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? So this man is performing many signs. Now, if you look over at the note that at least I've got on, chap on verse 47 with the word signs, it says, attesting miracles. In other words, this is, this is absolute proof. This is not from man. This is from God to do an attesting miracle. What he's doing is undeniable. The people are seeing it. There ain't a thing in the world we can do about it. First of all, why, do, why would they want to do anything about it? We'll get there. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come, away, come and take away both our place and our nation. Did you notice something there? Our place. Our nation. Their positions. These men are also wealthy. Their, their respect, the people you know, greeting them in the streets reverently, well, they're going to lose their place in society. Jesus is costing them that. I think that being put first before their nation is an indicator. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and the whole nation should not perish. Now this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. This is the best and the brightest also pretty corrupt. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. Not at all. There's about, historically, supposed to have been around 71 people in there. We don't have 71 people in this room. We've got a lot. It's good to see them all, especially some folks I haven't seen in a while. I have to see everybody. I want you to imagine being in a room with 71 people that are the absolute law of the land and being falsely accused to the point that they're wanting to kill you. Their decision is already pre-made. They're going to kill you. They're just looking for excuses to make it justifiable in their mind to the public so as to be acceptable. You're going to die. You're getting fall Who likes to be falsely accused? Nobody. Why? Because it's not fair. So, yeah, this is going to be a little longer than I intended. I'm sorry. Let's look down uh, back in Matthew chapter 26 at 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to deliver him up to you? And they weighed out to him thirty pieces of silver. And from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray him. Well, this is one of Jesus' hand-chosen, hand-selected apostles. One of the people who has been with him since he began his ministry. One of the people who has had the advantage of learning at a level that not everybody else has been able to learn at. And he's about to be betray betrayed by him. Is that fair? No. No, it's not fair. Look at verse 36. It 
Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and, I, and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And this is after he's already administered the Last Supper and told its purpose. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. You know, when I was younger, I just kind of read over that. Yeah, all right, began to be grieved and distressed. No, actually take a moment and think about that. Genuine grief, genuine distress, because after all, he's the son of God, but he is a human too. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. He is that stressed. When we read in other places, you know, tears and, and sweat as drops of blood. I've been pretty stressed out and sweated a lot before. I've never sweated drops of blood. And all of us at some point in time, if we've not experienced extreme grief, we're going to. And it's horrible. Jesus is experiencing extreme grief. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as thou wilt. There's several things to take out of this. Charlie could probably get about a day of work out of that. Jesus is scared. This is genuine fear because he is asked, he knows what's coming. He's already said, we just read it, that in two days he's going to be crucified. It was a horrible thing and not an uncommon sight to see people being crucified back then. And, and others have gone into the great detail on what's entailed with it. It's, terrible way to die and it's not quick he's got tremendous fear going on he's human I wouldn't want to die like that nobody would is it fair especially if you're innocent no and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour these are the people he is the closest to. He's counting on them for some sort of a support. They fell asleep on him. Is that fair? No. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again a second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. You know, again, my father, if, it cannot pass, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, thy will be done. Again, they fell asleep. Again, he's counting on them. Is this fair? No. People think of fear as weakness. We're told to fear God and keep his commandments. Fear is not necessarily weakness. It can be. The control of the fear is the thing that matters. Sergeant Major that I worked for in the Army uh, was a legend while he was still serving. And he was part of something in Vietnam where I, I'd read about it in a book and I was asking him about it. And uh, you know, they would do 12-man teams in these patrols and, and when they would attempt to get some rest, they, they, would, they would all form like a, a circle, kind of like sideways with their shoulders and backs against each other. And they would attempt to catch a cat nap like that. And they're out in the middle of the jungle. If one man moved, all of them woke up. You're not getting rest like that. And I, I said to him, you know, the book I was reading about you uh, was talking how a lot of guys would take amphetamine simply trying to stay awake and, and, and deal with that. He said, no, I didn't do that. And I said, you know, what kept you awake in these times? He said, fear. Well, as a young soldier, that was kind of a surprise. I'm not expecting to hear a sergeant major with 30 years' experience talking about that in, in that way. But he wasn't saying it as a bad thing. He was saying it, he used it as a positive thing. Jesus was afraid, but he controlled it. Not, not my will, but thine be done. He overcame that fear to the point of death. I'm running short on time. Let me just go ahead and minimize this a little bit. Let's go to verse 57 of chapter 20, of 26. 
And those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. So again, this is the entire Sanhedrin. The people that are best, the most pure, that have already said in advance, and hey, we got to kill him. But Peter was also following at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order that they might put him to death. Imagine going to the Supreme Court and instead of nine justices, it's 71. Imagine they're all trying to get false testimony against you to put you to death. And they're the law of the land. The Supreme Court. Is that fair? No. And they did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. You know, it's a sin for a false witness. It was actually punishable under uh, 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 Mosaic law. These guys are proven false. Has anything happened to them? No. Is that fair? No. But later on, two came forward and said, this man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. I didn't bother looking this up. I ought to have, but in that verse, he's talking about he's referring to himself. And the high priest stood up. That means he's been sitting the whole time. So the standing up, he's like, I've got him now. He stood up. This is a moment. And he said to him, do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? He knows exactly what it is that they're testifying against him. They're trying to get false testimony so they can justify their murdering of him. But Jesus kept silent. Who likes keeping their, 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 their mouth shut when you're getting falsely excused, uh, accused? Nobody. Is it fair? No. And the high priest said to him, and again, when I was younger, I'd just kind of read this and go over it and not really grasp the scene of, of what this must have been like. You know, I adjure you about how the living God. No, that's, no, this would have been a whole lot more intense. He's standing up. He's looking at Jesus. This is his moment. I've got him. I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Imagine that scene. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Now the Jews had this thing that they would do rhetorically. I don't remember what the term for it is. But sometimes you'll notice in the scriptures, they'll say, thou sayest, you said it. And that means... Rhetorically speaking, in a debate, you have got your opponent into a position where they're actually admitting the truth for you. That's not easily done. But the very fact that the high priest is saying this, Jesus flips it on him. He said, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the cloud of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes, saying, he is blasphemed. Now look, there's an exclamation mark at the end of that. He wasn't whispering it. He was saying this with em- emphasis, lots of it. What further need do we have of witnesses? As if his witnesses were doing any good. Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him. And said, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Is that fair? No, it ain't fair. It's easy to look at a tragic event that happens in life. For people to say, well, why did God take that baby's life? Why did God take that young woman's life? Why did God take my ancestor on his birthday? It's not God. It's sin. And the most innocent, most perfect person to ever live, the Son of God, who committed no sins, lived a perfect life, has to give his life in a hideously painful fashion to pay for our sins, my sins. Is that fair? No, 
but it's done out of love. And we have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper that Jesus instituted. It consists of the unleavened bread that represents his body and the fruit of the vine that represents the blood that he shed. Jesus died so that we can live eternally. Excuse me just a moment. I left mine back there. I want to say one more thing. If you think about it, with the introduction of sin into the world, God paid a high price because he had to watch his son die. Jesus paid a high price because he died. And it was a horrible way to die. No, it isn't fair. Life isn't fair, but God is. That is why he gave us the opportunity to obey the gospel, to have our sins forgiven, and to be able to go to heaven. Let's go ahead and ask a blessing on the bread. Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, we are so very thankful for the blessings that you have given us, and may we never take them for granted. The greatest possible blessing is that you sent your son to die on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven because you loved us so much. We pray that as we partake of this unleavened bread that represents the body of your son that suffered so horribly on that cross, that you would bless this bread, that you would bless us as we partake of it, and that you would help us to spiritually grow through this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's ask the blessing for the cup. Our wonderful Father in heaven, we come to you again, thanking you, praising you, and asking for your blessing on this cup that represents your son's blood that he shed for us. May we also partake of this in a way that pleases you, and may we receive spiritual growth from the partaking of it. In Jesus' name, amen.